Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jessica Palumbo, and I am an assistant professor of English here at East Georgia, um, along with library director Amanda McKenzie. I would like to welcome you to our first of the Big Read Small Talk lectures, and this is uh, gains a cultural perspective about the implications of a lesson before dying on social culture from the Jim Crow era to today, including the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. We are in the auditorium today, so we can record and broadcast this on YouTube as well, in case you were wondering. These lectures are part of the Big Read, a community-wide reading program that's made possible by grants from the National Endowment uh, for the Arts and also the Mill Creek Foundation. These events are based on Ernest Gaines novel and will continue through the end of September. If you don't already have a brochure, we have some on the table out front, so please pick one up on your way out. Um, if you need credit for the CATS course, please see Ms. McKenzie afterwards in the rotunda, right? Uh, next week, just a couple reminders. Uh, don't miss the next lecture in the series on Tuesday afternoon. Is that correct, Amanda? At 2.30? Okay. And we also hope to see all of you at Convocation on Thursday, September 22nd at 11. Um, Dr. Marsha Godet, a leading scholar on gains from Louisiana, will visit our campus to share more about the author's life and works. And now I'm pleased to introduce a fellow uh, faculty member of the Humanities Division, Dr. Van Denton. Dr. Denton is an assistant professor of English on our Statesboro campus. We are very grateful that she's traveled over today to be with us. She has a PhD in literary and cultural studies with an emphasis on Southern literature and African American literature. She's published several articles examining the way literature confronts the racial tension in the South, and she's currently working on a book for McFarland Publishers about African American literature and voodoo aesthetics role in promoting healing from cultural and historical traumas. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Denton. Thank you. I am going to do a um, different approach. I thought about how could I um, teach students m music as a teaching opportunity. So I decided to teach students how to look at a text and find that cultural perspective rather than me standing up here and babbling about cultural perspectives and what I've learned. So I'm going to walk you through how you look, how do you examine a text and understand what it's trying to teach us and how it speaks to us uh, culturally. So um, first thing we're going to do is look at what the text is about. We have a young man, Jefferson, who was at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's hinted that he may be autistic. They don't use that word, but it's hinted that he's innocent, an innocent type of person. He doesn't know, uh, quite know right from wrong. He gets in to a car with two buddies who are drunk and are going to the liquor store hoping to buy something on credit, but they're being black. The store owner would not extend credit. Things got a little out of hand and the two guys committed murder. They shot the store owner and Jefferson, poor Jefferson, he didn't know what to do. He, he didn't understand um, what to do after that. So he got caught in the store uh, with a dead white uh, owner, store owner, and the dead, two dead men. Of course, he was uh, pinned for the crime that he did not commit. And while he was in trial, the attorney that was supposed to defend him positioned him as somebody who wasn't much more than a beast, and particularly a hog. So he's pointed at Jefferson, said he, that he would much rather have put a hog to the electric chair than a man of innocence. Yet Jefferson was still uh, convicted and sentenced to, um, to the death chair, death penalty. So what we have from that first scene is the um, image of the black male as a beast. This speaks directly to the, method, um, the myth that our culture has created around the black male. And you can see this is a real uh, 
photograph or drawing, a lampoon that was in the papers right after Reconstruction, where you can see, if you know your history, you can see that this is supposed to be the Republican Party. And you, the elephant is made uh, into the image of a black male being driven by the Republican um, Party. So they're suggesting that the blacks that were put into political power after the Civil War were being uh, driven the same way beasts were manipulated and driven. So this is not a new image that Ernest Gaines is introducing. He's actually playing with this image by allowing Jefferson to be called a hog. So that image makes me question, what do I do with this? What do I want to say about this? What does Ernest Gaines want to say? And I tell my students, when you're wanting to write a paper, you need to ask the right questions about the context of the author's culture, the history of that um, era, and the political interest the author may have. And I try to tell them, do not confuse the author and the narrator. They're not necessarily the same. But in this case, there are a lot of similarities, and we'll talk about that soon. And we also want to examine the text signifiers. What authors, historical events, cultural attitudes are being echoed or signified? What religious symbols are present? And what does the author allude to, name, or echo? And so we want to go through that. So first, we're going to look at Ernest Gaines and his life. And we know that he was born in 1933. So you know that he grew up in the Jim Crow South in Louisiana, particularly on the same plantation where his ancestors had worked as slaves and then sharecroppers. So he didn't leave until he was an adult. Uh, so he grew up there uh, around stories, surrounded by stories that his parents or his aunt would tell. And so he g got a rich sense of the way things were before and during the Jim Crow South. He also earned a degree in literature and creative writing and became a successful writer and college professor. So we want to compare that to what's being said in the text, and we see similarities between Grant Wiggins and Ernest Gaines. Grant also lives in the same plantation community in Louisiana, where generations of the family served um, the same sharecropping and had before that had been slaves. The um, he also lives there and teaches school. He feels trapped, and he also enjoys literature. So you might get a sense that Gaines is working through some type of trauma that he might have experienced. Uh, so he might have something to say about the Jim Crow South. And these are the signifiers in the text. The setting is the Jim Crow South. He echoes uh, William Faulkner's works. The places that he signifies to or incorporates the jail, the church, the school, the plantation community, and there's a big allusion to the crucifixion. So these are major points that we would want to consider as we try to tackle the text. How are we going to write about the text? So what, then the next question is, why would Ernest Gaines want to pick up the conversation about the Jim Crow South? Why would he want to write about that? One thing comes to mind is cultural trauma, and that's a big term that's being thrown around this, um, the scholarly community right now. And it's basically what it means, intense events that have happened, experiences that have been experienced by groups of people. And these experiences were meant to degrade, debase, alter identity, oppress. And when we run into those types of experiences, they change us and they can be traumatizing to us. Race and poverty and gender are your three top traumatizing experiences in our culture today. Uh, one thing it's because when we encounter impressions on those three intersections, it impairs our emotional, psycho psychological, and cognitive development as we begin to question our own identity as we're fed what we should believe about ourselves. The book also promotes social change and healing through narrating that trauma. That's another thing that's being tossed around today in the literary uh, scholarly field, is that when we write fiction, 
somehow or another we're writing about our own traumas, our own cultural traumas, individual traumas, and that's a way that we work through those things so that we can get witnesses for that. Freud is one of the founder of that idea that fiction is some type of outlet there. And so Gaines may be looking at his novel being a way to write about his cultural traumas. And here are some quotes I wanted to pull from the um, novel, if you bear with me just a minute. Here are some examples of the cultural traumas that he introduces. He says, I was not there, meaning the first day of the court when the verdict was given. And this is how he starts the book out. I was not there yet. I was there. No, I did not go to the trial. I did not hear the verdict because I knew all the time what it would be. Just like everyone else in the quarter, I knew what that sentence would be. So from the very beginning, Gaines gives us this cultural trauma of um, mass incarceration, that guilty before being tried, being found innocent, the presumption of being guilty based on skin color. So he, he works from that point on and he says, the next time he points to some trauma, he says, he's talking about his, his own teacher, and his teacher tried to talk him out of being a teacher because he said it's too heavy of a burden to uplift an entire race. And he says to Grant, uh, he had told us then that most of us would die violently, and those who did not would be brought down to the level of beast. There is no freedom here. So you can see that this is resulting, um, this image goes right back to that beast image that we already began with, with the hog uh, as Jefferson. And the next point, uh, this is Grant talking about his role as a teacher and how impossible it is to uplift an entire race. He says, You'll see that it will take five and a half months to wipe away, peel, scrape away the blanket of ignorance that has been plastered and replastered over those brains and in the past 300 years. And this is something that Grant feels is a burden. He questions all the time, am I doing any good? Is this working? You know, what, why am I here? What purpose am I serving here? And so he feels that his efforts are fruitless, especially when he looks at Jefferson, who's been sentenced to the electric chair. Another one is, this is Grant talking to his romantic interest in the book, and he's talking about the burden that the black males have when they're born into a, a systematic uh, racist society such as ours. And he says, so each time a male child is born, they hope he will be the one to change the vicious cycle, which he never does. Because even though he wants to change it and maybe even tries to change it, it is too heavy a burden because all of the others who have run away and left their burden behind. So he too must run away if he is to hold on to his sanity and have a life of his own. So these are just a few examples of the trauma that I've isolated and to want to investigate more into the text. But the text also presents moments of healing, and this is very important to trauma narratives. If we are going to heal, if we're going to progress, we need to picture ourselves in a safe space. We need to picture ourselves overcoming the experience that have traumatized us. And this is where um, Gaines is a lot more successful than other African American uh, text. A lot of African American literature deals mainly with the trauma, the cultural trauma of lynching, of mass incarceration. We have images such as the tragic mulatto who ends in death because there's not a place for him or her in a society that's racist. They never move beyond the trauma. They're stuck in that trauma. The text closes in on that trauma instead of trying to find ways of healing and gains incorporates uh, ways of healing. And one of the passages is, I'm going to read it from here. He is talking to uh, Jefferson, and he's trying to get Jefferson to see the importance of Jeff Jefferson transforming from a hog to a man. He says, I need you. I need you much more than you can need me. I need to know what to 
do with my life. I want to run away, but go where and do what? I'm needed here and I know it, but I feel all that I'm doing here is choking myself. And another place he realizes much later in the text, he realizes that he needs to believe in something. This is where he's changed because before he had not believed. He had not believed in heaven or hell. He just, he didn't, he was just floating uh, there ideologi ideologically. So he says, only when the mind is free has the body a chance to be free. Yes, they must believe, they must believe, because I know what it means to be a slave. I am a slave. And this is the moment where Grant starts to transition and to heal from what has occurred to his life before. And then later in the novel, Jefferson, he's told that Jefferson was able to transform from being a uh, hog to a man. He says he was the strongest man there and straight he walked. So we have these moments of clarity where Grant can see the way of, to heal from these traumas. So the next question is, how is the text still relevant to us and why should we care? The two most obvious um, is mass incarceration and Black Lives Matter. The text deals with this premise that Jefferson was an innocent man who was sentenced to uh, death wrongly. And today we have this conversation taking place in our political arena that mass incarceration is uh, an unjustly and in proportionately putting black men behind bars. We look around to see if this is true. We see cases like the swimmer, the white swimmer who committed rape, uh, raped an unconscious girl, and he got six months of prison time and then was released three months after. The judge felt that he didn't want to give him a bigger sentence because he felt that that would have severe impact on the guy's life. Meanwhile, football player committed the same crime. He's black and he's been sentenced to a much lengthier sentence. So you can see that there is this disproportionate way in the way white criminals are processed to the system and the way black men are processed to the system. That leads us to the other, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, which is also focused on the racial injustices in the political system, in the uh, judicial system. And so we're going to see how this text might intersect with what we're experiencing today. So you might come up with a thesis statement if you're going to write about this text. There's something along the lines of, though a lesson before dying dramatizes African-American cultural memory and traumas, the novel also presents the opportunity for readers to have a transformation transformative experience, even as they recognize racism's overreaching grasp on today's society, especially our justice system. So I tell my students you would need to start by introducing the Jim Crow South, and Gaines does this very early in the text. He says, um, Bayonne was a small town, about 6,000, approximately 3,500 whites, approximately 2,500 colored. It was the parish seat for St. Raphael. The courthouse was here, there, so was the jail. There was a Catholic church uptown for whites, a Catholic church back of town for colored. There was a white movie theater uptown, a colored theater back, back of town. There were two elementary schools uptown, one Catholic and one public for whites, and the same for and the same back of town for coloreds. So very early Gaines shows us this Jim Crow South, this segregation that's taking place. And if you have seen photos, you know that these structures are not equal. That whole myth of separate but equal. You, you know that the black children suffered in these schools. The facilities were inferior, not clean, um, older. And so we also have key sites in the novel, which I've already introduced. Uh, the school. That passage introduces the school, the church, the theater, the courthouse, and the jail. These are structures that are important to the African American community in very political ways. The school, for one, Grant talks about how the school does not want the black children to learn dignity or integrity. They want um, them to not be any better than the hog that they 
designated uh, uh, Jefferson as. So he talks about the way he performs his duties. He says, I do exactly what the whites want me to do. So therefore, he's implicated in this system that has kept generations of black children down and they're limited in what they can do. And Grant also points that out. He says, I don't want to be a teacher. I don't like teaching. I don't like the children. I don't know if I'm doing any good. But it, he's an educated man. And he said, the only thing an educated black man can do is teach. So he himself is limited in what he can do. The church is another big uh, part of the African-American community. And Grant talks about how the whites view the preacher there as a safe preacher. They kind of police, um, quote unquote, the African-American community and uh, upholding morals and those kinds of things. And so the white community, Grant talks about the safety of the preacher because he doesn't step outside of what the white community wants from him. The theater is another place. If you read a lot of African-American literature, you see that the theater is a place for escape. It's where uh, black males uh, can go into the theater, sit in the dark. They're exposed to images uh, of success and of whiteness, things that they're never going to be able to fully participate in. But that moment in the dark, they um, can escape the systematic oppression. Then, of course, the courthouse and the jail. And we know from today that there is a pipeline from the school to the jail. And that's something that Grant comments on. He says, I can't teach them how to stay out of liquor stores. So these are places that teach and school young black men. And the lady, Shantae Martin, says, these sites operate as symbolic classrooms where African-American males are made aware of the limitations prescribed to their specific gendered racial identities and are conditioned to accept such restrictions. So you can see how uh, Gaines is working through. He's also confronting the myth. He says to uh, Jefferson, he says, do you know what a myth is, Jefferson? A myth is an old lie that people believe in. White people believe that they're better than anyone else on earth, and that's a myth. The last thing they ever want to see a black man stand and think and show that common humanity that is in us all. It would destroy their myth. They would no longer have justification for having made us slaves and keeping us in the condition we are in. As long as none of us stand, they're safe. They're safe with me. They're safe with Reverend Ambrose. I don't want them to feel safe with you anymore. And so this is one of the turning points in the novel where Jefferson begins to realize that there's so much more writing on this situation than his, the end of his life. Actually, Jefferson is becoming the redemptive figure or the Christ figure. And this is an important parallel. Christ was crucified as an innocent um, man who atoned for the sins of the world. And in the book, you get the sense that Jefferson was an innocent man who was atoning for the sins in a way of not to forgive the whites, but to make whites realize how they are uh, sinning, what kinds of things they are doing. And it works in a way, if you look at the way Southern literature has positioned the black male as victim. William Faulkner in particular, he writes a short story, That Evening Sun, the main character, one of the main characters, Jesus, is a black man. And the whole premise is that the character is named Jesus because Faulkner is showing how the similarities between the black man and Jesus Christ himself being both were hated by their communities, both were innocently uh, sacrificed to where, um, and they both have the burden of the scapegoat whole thing heaped up on them. And so this is exactly the kind of echo that Gaines is incorporating into uh, his novel with Jefferson. And then uh, Grant wants Jefferson to be the hero. He says, I want you to chip away at that myth by standing. I want you, yes, you to call them liars. I want you to show them that you are as much a man, more a man than they can ever be. 
And then he continues, it's the only way that we can chip away at that myth. You, you can be bigger than anyone you have ever met. You have the chance of being bigger than anyone who has ever lived on that plantation or come from this little town. So what Grant is doing in this scene is Grant has talked about the burden that he feels as a black male, racially uplifting. He says, it's too much. I can't carry this burden alone. And so he wants to place that whole entire burden onto Jefferson right before Jefferson goes to his death. And you think of Christ carrying the cross. And that's a very similar image as to what Jefferson will be doing. So you have the transformation where Grant is successful in making Jefferson become a man so that they're executing a man rather than a hog. So he says, um, though Grant, the Shantae Martin says, though Grant is asked to inspire Jefferson to develop the psychological resilience needed to endure this form of death, Grant is unable to eradicate Jefferson's ultimate fate. As Gaines suggests through a lesson before dying, social death is an outcome one cannot undo. African American men especially only have the capacity to change the response to this most unfortunate end. And so this is what Gaines is trying to teach, or uh, Grant is trying to teach. Let's change our response. Don't go to our desks uh, as hogs. Don't go to our desks, uh, you know, on all fours, but to walk upright as proud men full of dignity and, te and integrity. And Jefferson is able to do that. We see that at the end uh, where the white man says he was the strongest man in the crowded room. He was the strongest man there, and straight he walked, Frank Wiggins, straight he walked. And then you see change from this, the white man talking to Grant. He suddenly wants to be Grant's friend. He says, allow me to be your friend, Grant Wiggins. I don't ever want to forget this day. I don't ever want to forget him. So you see that through this small act of Jefferson transforming and walking that, that distance from the being held captive and then to the chair. He did so with such dignity and integrity that it got the attention of the men around him. So the book still leaves us with questions, like if the town and the prosecution understand that Jefferson is innocent, why did they execute him anyway? Faulkner lets us know. There's a short story called Dry September, and he gives us insight into that mentality when um, one of the characters are spe is speaking. If you've read the story, you know that it's a story about a white woman who was having interracial relations with a biracial man. And for some reason or another, she may be pregnant, we don't know, she accuses a black man of raping her. So the whole town knows what's going on. They know that she's probably lying about this because she pointed to one of the most outstanding black men in the community that people actually like. But yet there's this mob mentality of, of forming and they want to form a lynch mob and go after Willie and they do. And the barber's trying to stop them and it's just they're unstoppable. And the character says, you know, in response to it happening, he says, happen, what the hell difference does it make? Are you going to let the black sons get away with it until one finally does it? So you see this whole mentality of needing to punish black bodies, whether or not they have committed crime is just, it's the same as when they lynched black bodies, they left them in the uh, on the trees for warnings. That's what they did with Michael Brown's body. Um, recently, that started the whole Black Lives Matter protest in Missouri. So you see this psychological, pathological need that this power structure needs to maintain its dynamic. So how does Jefferson's story fit into the new Jim Crow and the Black Lives Matter? The book, The New Jim Crow, it's recently published, it's been, it's, it's been out for a few years, and it's making a big splash. She asserts that governments use punishment primarily as a tool of social control and thus the extent of severity 
of punishment is often unrelated to the actual crime. And I think we see that already with the example I gave with the white rapist who got three months and the black rapist who got considerably um, more. And so it has nothing to do with crime. You think of the war on drugs where those, and it's been proven that the black um, people who are picked up on drug charges, they suffer bigger penalties than the whites who have been picked up on the same charges. She's saying that this is the new Jim Crow because once somebody's been in that system, they can no longer vote. They don't have right, the same rights that the incarcerated have. So she's saying that these, this type of oppression is exactly the same type of oppression that occurred in the Jim Crow South. And because the import, disproportionate numbers of black men being incarcerated, she's saying that this is exactly the same thing. It's just, it has a new face. It's going by a different name. Also, the black lives continue to be violently pol uh, policed, brutalized, and their lives are systematically devalued and marginalized. So we can see as we read a lesson before dying that the lesson is more toward the reader of understanding the humanity that is within Jefferson and how the system is stacked up against him from the beginning. And we can see, we can finally understand um, the Black Lives Matter movement, what they're trying to say to us. It's not that they're trying to say Black Lives only matter. They're trying to say Black Lives Matter too. And that's where a lot of us, especially living in this post-racial uh, or colorblind society, we are overlooking that. The historical violence, the police brutality, the, um, the lynch mobs, all of that. We, we are overlooking that because we're not experiencing that. But these are cultural traumas that are still with us today. And it's still guiding uh, our politics. It's still interfering with the way the police do their jobs. The stereotypes themselves evoke fear, and they degrade and debase um, the black community. So in conclusion, we know that the lesson before dying teaches us how black lives have historically been marginalized. We can understand that and see that, how they've been devalued, policed, and brutalized by institutional racism. If we feel empathy for Jefferson, if we cry for Jefferson the way Grant did, what should we be doing with our own voices and political power uh, to produce change in our society? And that's how we get at cultural perspectives. And I'll just, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for coming and I'm open for questions. What should we be doing? I, there's a lot of different ways. We all have different strengths and talents. Uh, for me, during my life right now, it's teaching. It's teaching in the classroom. It's helping my students see, understand racial tension. A lot of my classes are geared right in that race class and gender intersection and oppression. And at first they're uncomfortable and they don't want to talk about it. And then toward you know, about right now, fifth week, sixth week, they're into it, they understand it, they're open about it, they begin to bond together. So that's how I'm using my voice right now, is in the classroom, I teach 125 students a uh, semester, and I've had students already respond to me, thank you for teaching me not to be racist, I don't wanna be racist, how do you overcome racism, and those types of things. I wanna also encourage my students to listen, especially the white students, to listen to the complaints, to listen to the history, and to make those connections between the now and the then, and see the aftermath. That we are still in the aftermath of slavery. And I remind my students, there's that scriptural, uh, the scripture about the sins of the father being visited upon the heads of the, and we're there. We are, we have those sins upon us, and we are still suffering that. So how would somebody else uh, answer that question? I have friends who are also professors who are actively engaged in this fight against mass incarceration. They teach at prisons, that's what they do with their time. They volunteer to go into prisons. They have book clubs in prisons, book drives for prisons. They're working, actively working to make a difference in the uh, 
judicial system. I have other friends who are joining Black Lives Matter movement and seeking protests in that way. So it depends on your your risk. I don't want to be at a, a protest <laughs> right now. I'm not I'm not that kind of personality, but I do want to fight the fight. But it just depends on your what you can do, and it might just be something small as just branching out and out of our comfort zones and having conversations with people who are willing to discuss things with us. Anybody else have an experience? Oh, yeah. I'm familiar with, and what was his name, the one? Colin. Yeah, Colin. I'm familiar with the way the white America has attacked his protest, and what his protest is is no different. I don't see it any different as from the 1960s protest. I don't see him as unpatriotic or un-American. I see him loving the ideals of America. Our ideals are beautiful, freedom and democracy for all. But we had to admit, that's not the case. The, there's a discrepancy between what we value and the way we practice that. So I think he's bringing attention to what needs to be looked at and examined, but it's a difficult topic that people in power don't want us to visit and to work through. They need that division between the people. But that is an, that's one way that he's using his voice to bring awareness. Thank you so much.